was any life on the earth, our bodies laid in the dust. We are made from the dust out of the potash and calcium and petroleum and cosmic light. God sent forth the great Holy Spirit to brood over the earth. And as he brewed, the little flowers began to come, and the birds flew out. And animals came from the earth, and then came a man. And he sinned and separated himself from the fellowship of his God. And because of this horrible thing, he was commanded by God to return back to the dust of the earth. But, oh, Lord God, we are so glad that before he returns, you have promised a Redeemer. And today, since he has come and sent forth the Holy Spirit again, and now he's still brooding over the dust, our bodies, and if he raised me and brought me to what I am now without having a choice, how much more will he raise us from the dust of the earth as we've made a choice yes. and he has brewed to us and we brewed back to him. Yes. We love him. We have the blessed assurance that someday these vile bodies will be changed and made like unto his own glorious body whereby he's able to subdue all things unto himself. We would ask tonight that he would come and brood again over this people, sending forth his spirit in every heart, condemning sin and sickness, and bringing people to a realization that they are here for a purpose. And that purpose is just not to build houses and to plant vineyards ride in automobiles and dress in good clothes and go to churches, but it is to worship Him. And may we tonight with all that's within us to worship Him in the Spirit and in the truth. Grant it, Lord. And when we leave tonight to go to our different homes, may we stay along the road like those who came from Emmaus. Did not our hearts burn within us? as he talked to us along the road. For we ask it in his name and for his glory. Amen. You be seated. It's been indeed a great privilege to be here in this wonderful little city and to minister in the name of the law. And to have fellowship with the different ones that we have met. And this dear pastor, Brother Ball, I believe is his name, that shook hands with on the platform. I want to say that I believe he has did everything that lays within his human power to make the meeting a success for you people. And you should appreciate a minister like that. And with all these other ministers who have their names on here in their churches, who have perhaps dismissed them cooperating in these meetings, yet not knowing me, and just by faith and believing, you did it. And I pray that God will richly and abundantly bless you for every effort that you have put forth. And now we are sad that we have to leave just these two nights. We're going on down to a place called Miss Everett, I believe, in your lovely state of Massachusetts. And there from on up then into Maine. Then after a while, in a few weeks, I'll be going overseas to Africa, India. In there, seemingly, my ministry has a greater impact. The American people doesn't receive it too well because America is an intellectual people. People who have based their thoughts upon the psychic side of psychology and intellectual and what their eyes can see, fine buildings and great, well-educated uh, preachers who have scholarships and so forth. 
And upon the supernatural, they are very skeptical. And that's to fulfill the scripture. In Africa, one afternoon I've seen 30,000 blanket heathens with idols in their arms except Jesus Christ, his personal Savior. 30,000 tagged heathens. Bombay, India, with the Mohammedans, the Buddhas, Jinns, and Sikhs, and so forth. It was just, you couldn't number them. It was estimated that almost a half a million were there because a blind man received his sight at the platform. And in uh, Africa, a man led with a chain like a collar around his neck like a dog, not even mentally right, was perfectly and normal standing in the room before the people of the race thing. The American people sees even greater than that. I'm not talking about you born-again Christians. They go around and say, well, it's some kind of a hypnotism. It's, uh, it's uh, perhaps maybe a... A telepathy or something. No wonder the guns are trained on us for judgment. We cannot escape judgment. I've said this and I say it not to be sacrilegious or to be different, but if God let this nation get by with the sin that it's doing, you'd have to raise up Sodom and Gomorrah and apologize for burning them up. That's right. God has to remain the same. He loves the sinner, but he hates sin. And he's just, and he's sovereign, and he must judge sin. So as our nation continually waves in sin, big grims, old Robert, Jack Schuler, others who grow through the nation with great striking revival, they continually sins on the march, you can't tell them. Because the devil has taken the nation over, it came to us a few years ago. He lived in Paris. The devil and his angels. And they had the First World War. And Germany would have sunk this nation beneath the earth. But we went over to help them. And as soon as it was over, it was back again, wine, women, in big time. Then Satan sent his patterns over here, stripped our women, brought disgrace to our nation through the patterns and fashions. Then he just took his army and landed in Hollywood. Many of you people wouldn't let your children go to picture shows and see such stuff. The devil's a smart man. He brings it right in on television, so you'd be sure to get it. And today, people stay home from prayer meetings and great religious gatherings because they want to see We Love Susie or something like that, or Elvis Presley in a rock and roll. That's the naked truth. God's anger is kindled against the nation, and you're going to receive and punishment and judgment write it in the fly leaf your Bible and say that Brother Branham said so. If it doesn't come to pass, I'm a false prophet. For I have thus saith the law. So you escape that wrath. There's only one way. There, I noticed on your streets and around and here you got the bomb shelters. One do you one speck of good. What would happen at a bomb that can blow a hole in the ground 175 feet deep for a three miles square? What if you were 500 foot down in the ground and be such a concussion there wouldn't be a bone left in you? But I'm directing you tonight to a real bomb shelter. You don't dig in the earth, it's made out of feathers under his wings. That's the real bomb shelter. Flee tonight from the wrath that is to come. And remember, these meetings are directed not to any certain organization. That day of fussing is over. God's calling his church, his people. And the word church means called out. 
God bless you ministers and your people. And I trust that our little two-night stay will prove a, such a result that there will be an old-fashioned revival break through this country here that will stain the waters until the last edible fish is taken out for the kingdom of God. That's my prayer. Billy met me there just a minute ago, and he said, Daddy, they took a love offering for you. Wasn't necessary. I don't take money. I never took an offering in my life with myself. But I must have money to exist. My, I've kept my ministry real humble so there would not be uh, any great expense attached to it. My expenses only run to about $100 a day at home, small office. Now, you say that may be a whole lot of money. What does Brother Roberts run a day? Oral Roberts. Somewhere between seven and 10000 Billy Grimm's will double it. But my ministry requires, sometimes I go hold a meeting where there's only a church that would hold 20 people if the Holy Spirit calls. Then I can go to a place that, where we have millions if necessary. Then somebody sponsors that and pays for it. So I just live quietly and humbly and serve the Lord. And I thank you for the offering. Whatever it is, it'll go to the kingdom of God the best of my knowledge. Your money that you placed in, I'm the steward over it now as a witness of Christ. And I pray that he'll bless you for it. I'll do the best that I can to see that it goes towards the kingdom of God. We hope to be back with you again someday if that seems, seems pleasing to God and the will of this church and people. Now pray for us as we go to the field. I always try to ask the people, now over there it's not like it is here, just as soon as you mention something, which doctors and everything is on a challenge. I have never seen a time or what God always taken the victory, come out and thousands of souls were saved, which doctors converted, and so forth, when that happened. You be praying for me. Now, before we open this word, let's have just another word of prayer. Lord God, men who are able to move their hands could open the lids of the Bible, but the Holy Spirit will have to interpret this word. So we ask that his great presence will come and will anoint the lips that speak and the ears that hear. Grant it, Lord, for we ask it in Jesus' name that we might fellowship around the word. Amen. In the book of St. Mark's 11th chapter, I wish to read the 20th verse. And in the morning... As they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the root. And Peter, calling to remembrance, said unto him, Master, behold, the fig tree which thou didst curse is withered away. And Jesus answering said unto them, Have faith in God. And that's my text for just a few moments. And we're late, but I don't want you to think of that. Get that from your mind just for this time. We may be our last time many of us will ever meet together on earth. So let's pay close attention to his word. And as I try by his help to take this little text for just a few moments, have faith in God. You might say, Brother Branham, that's a... A very little text, but it isn't the size of it, it's what it means. That's enough scripture to save the entire world and to heal every sick person in the world. Bring Jesus back to earth again. I was quoting some time ago in one of the services of a little boy that I knew of in a certain city who was clamoring around in an attic. And he found in this old attic or garret an old trunk, and digging down into the trunk, he found in there a little yellow postage stamp. It was yellow from age. And he took it over to his stamp collection friend, and he said, How much will you give me for this stamp? 
Well, he was expecting five or ten cents with perhaps ice cream cone in his mind. He said, looked it over the collector, and he knew it was a valuable saint, so he said, I'll give you a dollar bill for it. Well, that was a good, quick sale for the little lad. He collected the dollar, the stamp collector taking the stamp. And down the street he went for his ice cream. And the stamp collector begins to work on the stamp. A few weeks later he sold it for $500. And then a little after that it was sold for about $3,000. And now they say it's worth a quarter of a million dollars. You see, it wasn't the little yellow paper because you wouldn't even have picked it up if it was on the street. But what made it so valuable was what was wrote on that little yellow paper. And that's the way with this tonight. It's just a piece of paper, not very valuable paper, but it's what wrote on it that's so much value because it is the Word of God. All heavens and earth will pass away, but that word shall never pass away. A man is just as good as his word. You're just as good as your word. I'm just as good as my word. If I can't take your word, I want no dealings with you. I want you to be the same to me, and we must be the same to God. If he can't keep his word, then I want to know who is God that can keep his word. So he said, have faith in God. So little faith, why, it's the most common thing there is. You can't even get a drink of water without faith. You couldn't come to this meeting without faith. You cannot move your finger without faith. It's said in the scripture that when they put the blood on the lintel of the door for the Passover in Egypt, it was put on with hossip. Do you know what hossip is? Hossip is common weed. You can just find it anywhere. And that's the way the blood is to be applied to the heart door tonight, is by something common, faith. We try to press it out and make it something that no one can take a hold of. It's so simple that you go over the top of it trying to find it. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, said the writer of Hebrews 11th chapter, first verse. Now, it is a substance of things hoped for. Now, it's not just imagination, it's something you have. For instance, if I was starving to death, and you come to me and you said, what will save your life? I'd say to you, one loaf of bread. And you'd say, Mr. Branham, here's 25 cents. That 25 cents is the purchasing power of a loaf of bread. Well, when I got that 25 cents, I could rejoice. You gave me the purchase power of a loaf of bread. Now, I haven't got the bread. The 25 cents is not the bread. But it is the purchasing power of the bread. And when I've got the purchasing power, it's just as good as having the bread. Now, that's the way it is by faith. People look and say, I haven't got faith enough for my crippled hand. If you had faith, you wouldn't even look at your crippled hand. See, faith is the substance of things hoped for. Now, I can be just as happy with the 25 cents as I could with a loaf of bread. Because I've got the thing that buys the loaf of bread, and as soon as I get to the market, I've got a loaf of bread. And faith is the thing that brings my healing, and no matter how long it takes me to get to that place, I've got the faith that's going to do it as soon as I get there. You get it? Now, I can be just as happy with the quarter as I can with the bread. And when down in your heart you believe that God has healed you, just as, just as real as you believe you've got strength to walk out that door, or just as well as the sight of 
the sense of sight says that church white, it's finished. There's nothing can take it away from you. Because it's gone beyond intellectual, it's gone to your heart, it's real faith. Now going to get this loaf of bread, I might have to go over broad patches and down over bridges and cross streams and up the hills. But all the time I'm going, I'll be shouting with all my heart, holding up my 25 cents because I'm on my road for the bread. And if Christ reveals to me tonight that I am healed, I can rejoice just as much as I could jump up and down on the floor, no matter whether I'm still crippled or whether I'm still sick, my head still hurts or what about it, I'm just as happy because I'm on my road with the purchase power. That's Faith. Jesus said, have faith in God. Notice how vital. But now, you say my faith is little, and I'm sure God will not notice my faith. It's too small. He said, if you have the faith the size of a mustard seed, which is the smallest of all the seeds, but being a rancher myself and studying agriculture, mustard seed is one seed that won't mix with no other seed. It's all mustard, and it's going to remain mustard. And you might not have faith enough to have a miracle performed on you, and if you just got mustard seed faith, stay with it. It'll lead you to the light, and it won't mix with nothing else. No matter what anyone says, you still believe it. No matter what your symptoms say, you still believe it. Because it's real faith and won't mix with doubt anywhere. Mustard seed faith. And God recognizes that little faith that you got. Here not long ago in Canada, the late King George came down the street. And a friend of mine, Mr. Baxter, as he stood on the street, and watched the parade. And the schools all turned out. And they give the little children little flags of Britain to wave at the king as he passed by. And when the king passed by, the little children singing, God save the king, and waving their little flags. After the procession was over, the little fellows returned back to their school. And in one certain school in British Columbia, Vancouver, there was a little girl who did not return. And the teacher was excited. And she ran out into the streets and began to look for the little girl. Where could she be? And after a while, they found her leaning up against the telegraph pole and was weeping her little heart out. And the teacher picked her up in the arms and he said, she said, bless you, honey, why are you weeping? And the little girl sobbing so she couldn't even tell the teacher. Her little heart was broke. And the teacher said, did not you see the king? She said, yes, I saw the king. Did you wave your flag? Yes, I waved the flag. And did you sing, God save the king? She said, I joined with the rest of them singing, God save the king. And the king passed this way, yes. And you saw him, yes. Well, why are you crying? She said, teacher, the reason I'm weeping, I saw the king, but I was too little. He didn't see me. That's not so with Jesus. No matter how little you are, or how little your faith is, just wave it. He'll see it just as well as he sees the other's faith. Oh, that makes him so lovable, so real. No matter how small, whatever you offer him, he's ready to receive it. And then, another thing, faith works much by experience. 
Or may I change that and say it this way? Experience companies things. Usually, if you've had an experience, it will be a great help to your faith. One time when Israel had been called out to battle and the, against the Philistines and the armies had gathered with a valley between them. And the Philistines, like the modern world, when they think they've got something on you, they love to blow about it, as we call it in the South. Like the a street expression kind of pop off steam about it. The days of miracles is past. There's no such a thing as divine healing. Where the greatest church there is in this city, all of our rituals claim those things are gone. But the Bible claims that they're real. Go get rid of your ritual. And so they had a great challenger by the name of Goliath, which was, oh, he was like a prehistoric giant. His great fingers were 14 inches long, the Bible says. And his spear was like a weaver's needle, perhaps longer than some years to the wall. Now, what would an ordinary man do with such a man as that in battle? And maybe many times bigger than a great big man. Maybe eight or ten times bigger. And now when they seen they had such a man, he made a proposition with them. He walked out and, you know, sin is so treacherous and unbelief is sin. And unbelief is so treacherous it plays a lot of innocent tricks on you. So he walks out. He said, we shouldn't have any bloodshed. We just so you join church, that's all that's necessary. We shouldn't have any bloodshed. Let us make a proposition. You choose you a man out of your army and let him come fight with me. And if I kill him, then you all serve us. And if he kills me, we'll serve you. Sure, when they got the odds like that. And every man in Israel's heart fainted because they thought maybe he'd be called to go on the challenge. But from the king on down, every one of them was scared. So the big giant would come out daily and blow himself. Why don't you come on over? And let's just settle it. No one moved. And if there was any man in the group that was able to do it, was Saul, the king. The first thing he was, the scripture said he was head and shoulders above his army. Any man in the army, he measured head and shoulders above him. And he was a warrior. He was well trained. He trained man to fight with the spear. Or if there's any man that was trained and, and seemingly, humanly speaking, able, it was Saul. Just like today, if there's any person that should be trained for divine healing and preaching, the power of God should be these seminaries in schools. But usually the biggest cowards we got. Oh, they should know the word. They should know God's power. But many of them turn out knowing no more about God than a hot and pot does about an Egyptian knife. I'm not trying to act smart. I'm just stating a fact. And I'm, I think that the schools and colleges are all right, but you can't stop at that. And many times that's the reason our pulpits are so weak today and don't believe God and don't teach faith for the whole atonement is because they've been hatched out in such a place as that. A seminary preacher always reminded me of an incubator chicken. You know, a little incubator chicken 
He was born all right, but he just chirped, 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 and ain't got no mammy to go to. That just reminds me, they holler and carry on and don't know no more about God because they all he knows the school. I'd like to have a man if he didn't know the difference between split beans and coffee and know God is a baptism of the Holy Spirit and filled with his glory and power and all the education you could turn into a man and not know God. That's the reason our pulpits are weak. Because we say the days of miracles is fast. Look where our mammy is. It's a mechanical incubator that's hatched out like by the dozen. Notice. And Saul was a scared with all of his training. And the best equipped man to do it, but he was afraid to do it. Why? He never had much experience. He knows about taking more than knowing how to maneuver a spear. And yet they were the armies of the living God. And today our pulpits and our seminaries represent the armies of the living God. But one day his God always has it. There come a little ruddy and naughty looking guy that had, had some experience. His pappy gave him some cakes and told him to go out to the army to see his brother. He is too ruddy and young to be in the army. The Bible said he was ruddy, which means a little bitty drawn up sort of a fella. And his name was David. And here he appeared over on the hill and Goliath made his boast at the wrong time. There was a man of God in camp. So he might not have had his collar oh, backwards or, or something. He might not have had a Ph.D. or D.D., but he knowed some experience about God. And he had his little sheepskin coat on. He didn't have no armor and sword. But he just walked up there and Goliath come out and made his big blow. The days of miracles is past. There's no such a thing. David said, do you mean to tell me that you men who are trained would stand there and let that big bully, uncircumcised Philistine defy the armies of the living God? Why, the courage of that little naughty looking fella. And that got around to the king. He said, I'll go fight him. Oh, they thought that boy silly. He has no schooling. He has no education. He don't know what a sword means. He don't know what an armor means. He hasn't got a Ph.D. or a D.D. either one. So what in the world could he do? So it come to the king, the bishop. So he said, I admire your courage. But I don't believe you can do it. He said, look, king. King said, well, if you want to go, I'll give you your education. I'll put a sword in your hand, put my armor on you. So David stood wondering. And they give him a Bachelor of Art degree. And they give him a DD. And they took Saul's armor and placed it on him. The poor little fellow was weighted plumb to the ground. He said, take this stuff off of me. That's good for preachers. Take this stuff off of me. I don't know nothing about how you can say, ah, man, and talk about some sort of theology. I don't know nothing about it. I've never been trained to it. But there's one thing I do know. That back gunner on the back side of the hill, I was herding my daddy's sheep and a bear running and got one. And I took this little old thing, shot and knocked him down with it. And a lion come in and got one. And I knocked him down. He rose up and I took a sword and killed him. 
and the God that delivered me out of their paws, how much more will he deliver me out of that uncircumcised Philistine? Saul found out that his ecclesiastical vest didn't fit a man of God. He said, I know nothing about that, but let me go with something I've had some experience with. Blessed be the name of the Lord. What the ministry needs tonight is not so many BAs or DDs, but it's an experience of the baptism of the Holy Spirit that puts life into the man and gives him faith in a living God that changes not. An experience. Moses was taught in all the wisdom of the Egyptians. And he had 40 years of teaching under his mother. And he could even teach the masters of Egypt. But it taken God just 40 years to get that all beat out of him on the back side of the desert. And one day while he was herding Jethro's sheep, running from Egypt, running from the task, and thought he'd just go back to work and let it all go. Because he'd tried it himself without having any experience. Teaching's all right, but the letter killeth, the Spirit giveth life. And in the presence of that burning bush, he know more about God in five minutes than he'd been taught in 40 years. What was it? It was an experience. He just didn't have a letter to read, or the laws to read, or the books to read. He had an experience that God still lived. The God of Abraham was just as alive in that day, in that foreign land, as he was when he talked to Abraham or Adam. That's what it takes. Every man that ever goes to the pulpit ought to have the place in his heart. A back side of the desert. God gives all of his children that experience where you meet God and talk to God. And he talks back to you and you know there's something real. All the doctors of divinity in all the world, they might explain this away and talk that away but they'll never be able to take you away from that back side of the desert experience where you meet God face to face. Then when Moses had met God, he afterward took the children of Israel through the fires of hell, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Not by his teaching, but by the experience experience he had. Abraham, after his call from the, out of the valley of Shinai, the land of the Chaldeans, and the city of Ur, after God talked to him, spoke to him when he was 75 years old, and told him, Sarah being 65, you're going to have a baby by Sarah. After God spoke to him, he had an experience. And he could call those things which were not as though they were. No matter what anyone said. Could you imagine that old couple? Abraham running downtown with Sarah to do a little shopping. Almost a hundred years old. Buy up all the bird eye and the pins you can get a hold of, honey. We're going to take a trip now. You're going to have a baby. We better may go see the doctor. Doc, wife and I are going to have a baby. Say, how old are you? Well, the old man's off at his head. See, there's something wrong with him. We maybe had better send him to the psychopathic ward. Some psychiatrist to talk to him. God had talked to him. And he could call those things which were not as though they were and got stronger all the time. 
He had an experience. He knew there was a God who talked. And he was fully persuaded that he was able to keep anything that he promised. Amen. The word amen means so be it. And notice him. After the first 28 days, he goes to Sarah. He'd lived with her since she was a little girl, about 16. And here she is an old, she could have been a great, great grandma. And he said, after the first 28 days, I remember she is many years past menopause. Sarah, how do you feel? Not a bit of difference, darling. Well, bless God, we're going to have it anyhow. A year passed. How you feel, Sarah? No different. Praise God, it's going to be a greater miracle. We'll have it anyhow. Twenty-five years passed. How you feeling, darling? No different. Praise God, we're going to have it anyhow. Because I talked to God who talked back to me, and He's able to do anything that He promised to do. And He's the same Lord God tonight. Never met Him. Experience, company's faith. It calls anything contrary to the word as though it was not. The word comes first. As I stood there behind the curtain tonight, listening to Dr. Vail, it was after that Philip had brought Nathaniel or went to find Nathaniel. After Philip heard Jesus tell Peter what his name was and what his father's name was, it was after that that he recognized him. He had an experience. He'd heard him tell that, that come, this is the Messiah. Nathaniel couldn't believe it. So he walked up into the presence of the Lord Jesus. And Jesus said, Behold an Israelite in whom there's no guile. He said, Rabbi, when did you know me? He said, before Philip called you when you were under the tree, I saw you. It was after that that Jesus said, because I told you this, do you now believe you'll see greater things than this? It was after the woman at the well who came out there as a prostitute, we'd call her today, a woman of ill fame. She came out to the well to get water. And she seen this Jew sitting over against the well. She never saw him before. He was a stranger in the city because that was a Samaritan city. And here was a Jew. And he asked her for a drink. And she said, it's not customary for you Jews to ask us Samaritans such. And the conversation went on. Jesus trying to contact her spirit to see what her trouble was. And he said, go get your husband and come here. She said, I have no husband. But that's right. You've had five husbands. And the one you're now living with is not yours. She said, Sir, I perceive that you're a prophet. Now, we know that when the Messiah cometh, he'll do these things. But who are you? He said, I'm he that speaks with you. It was after that she had seen his power through God. God to know the secrets of her heart that she could run into the city and say, come see a man who told me the things that I've done. Isn't this the Messiah? It was after she had seen it. After the miracle had been performed on them. It was after Jesus had cursed the tree and in 24 hours saw it withering that he told the disciples, have faith in God. After they had seen the power of God, they were asked to have faith in God. Jesus said in Acts 1.8, You shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Not before when you get your Ph.D., but after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Then you'll have power of faith to believe. It was after they had waited ten days in the upper room with this promise. The doors and windows locked because they were scared. It was after the Holy Ghost came down on them with tongues of fire. 
and the Spirit like a rushing mighty wind. After that happened, they wasn't as scared then. They went into the streets and declared to all people that he was a resurrected Christ. After that, they, they evangelized the world and sealed their testimony with their blood after they had received power, after they had the Holy Ghost. Oh, how thankful I am to know that great faith in God is still accompanied by an experience. And tonight you may not have had that experience. But if God will come tonight in the power of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, who said in St. John 5, 19, I do nothing till the Father shows me first. If he will come and will do the same thing in this audience to prove, he said, I, a little while and the world won't see me no more. Yet ye shall see me, for I will be with you even in you to the end of the world. I'll be the vine. You be the branches. The vine doesn't bear fruit. The branch bears fruit. And the branch will bear fruit of what kind of a vine is sticking in. And if you've grown up out of a seminary vine and just got an education in theology, that's the kind of a fruit you'll bear. If you come up in that kind of a church, that's probably the way you believe. But if you've been planted, rooted and grounded in Christ Jesus you will bear the fruits of Christ. You have to. If you've got that experience, the fruit's not strange to you. Let us look to Him now as we pray. Oh, what a wonderful listening audience. How it would be nice if I could stay longer. I've been already a half hour. I wonder tonight, that if you haven't got that experience of knowing that Jesus remains alive tonight, that He's just the same as the Scriptures yesterday, today, and forever, and you would like to have that experience, though you be a church member, now let every head be bowed and every eye closed, and those who are on praying grounds pray. Let it be secretly between God and I and you. Would you just slip up your hand to God and say, God, give me a real experience that I can really believe. God bless you. Got your hands up around? Say, Lord, I, I've never seen anything like they're talking about. God bless you. Your hands up everywhere. I've never seen nothing like that, but my enthusiasm is just like the Queen of the South. See, she didn't know either. She heard that God gave a great gift to the church. She was a heathen, a pagan. She had forsaken her church, her pastors, her bishops, her popes. She had to forsake everything, her pagan idols. But her heart was burning. She heard that there was a gift of discernment up in Israel. She traveled over a hot burning desert for three months. As I've often said, not in an air-conditioned Cadillac, but on the back of a camel, a heathen, never heard of anything any more than her heathen temple. But she'd come in the presence of Solomon. She'd come with enough gold to support it if she'd seen it was right. She sat down and watched the meeting. After she'd seen the great wisdom that God had given Solomon, the spirit of discernment, coming from a true living God that knows that Man did not have this discernment. It had to come from God. She raised up and she said, All that I heard is true and more. She gave her gold and her offerings to support this great gift that God had given. And Jesus said, She'll raise up in the day of the judgment and condemn this generation. For she came to see a gift of Solomon. And he said, Behold, a greater than Solomon is here. What will she do when she comes to the judgment with New England in the day of the judgment? When people won't come across the street? 
They won't walk in to leave their television long, long enough to come see. She'll rise up in the judgment and condemn millions times millions of American church members. Oh, God, be merciful. Men and women are holding their hands up in the air. Young children and teenage. They haven't seen yet, yet they believe. You're a good God. The disciples believe. Thomas said, let me put my fingers in his hands. He said, here you are, Thomas. You've seen and so you believe, and that's good. But these believe without seeing. So has it been tonight, Lord, dozens of hands that never had seen and yet believe, just because I brought it from your word. I pray that you'll manifest yourself now in your great power of the resurrection. That when that great bomb does fly us away, that Sputnik with thousands of German or Russian soldiers with their atomic bomb hanging here, shredder or go to dust. What could we do? Oh God, the church will be gone then. Grant tonight peace and mercy to them. May they find Christ real in their heart. For when they raised their hands, they broke every scientific law that could be broken. Gravitation proves that our hands must hang down. But when they raised their hands, it showed there was a spirit standing by them. And they had a spirit. And this spirit said, you're a sinner, you're wrong. You're a church member, but you're not right. And that spirit in them made a decision that they wanted to be right, and they defied the laws of gravitation and lifted up their hands to their Creator. You said, no man can come except my Father draws him first. Then the Father is here drawing you. And all that comes to me, I'll give him everlasting life and will raise him up at the last day. We believe it, Lord. Now manifest yourself tonight in our midst. Show that you're still a living for we ask that in Christ's name, while you heal the sick, and we'll praise thee. Amen. I am sorry to have kept you a little bit. That's not idle. Now I want you to be real reverent just for a few moments. The hour is now at hand to what all that I have said and all that Dr. Vail has said and all the scriptures has promised. It's got to be found truth or false. It's got to be right or wrong. I was listening when it said this, that Jesus remaining the same, the way he declared himself to both Jew and Samaritan and not the Gentile, the Gentiles had 2,000 years to call out the church. And now it's the end of the Gentile age. I wonder how many people here has been taught that and believe it. Let's see your hand. You've got some good teachers around here. This is the end of the Gentile age. With the same ministry where those Jews standing hold those little Bibles that Brother Petrus from Stockholm sent up a million or more down there, and they were reading it how Jesus did. They said, them that come up from Iran, Iran and down in there that the Look magazine and them, Life, showed these Jews packing their loved ones on their back. They, we got it all on television. Uh, Protochrome uh, color. And we'd interview them, Brother Oregon Bright, many of the Christian businessmen. And they said, Are you coming home to the old homelands to die? I said, No, we've come to see the Messiah. When the fig tree puts forth its bud, the six point star of David hanging over there, the oldest flag in the world, flying again for the first time for 2,000 years. No, 2,500 years. Think of it. They said, where is the Messiah? And then when they read these Bibles, they said, if this Jesus was the Messiah, and he claims here that he's raised from the dead, let us see him do the sign of the prophet. We'll believe him. Oh, what a real thing. My heart jumped. I said, I want a ticket. I'm going. I'll call thousands of them out. Say, did you mean that? They believe they're prophets. And when I got to Cairo, Egypt, 30 minutes of Palestine, 
I'd have my ticket in my hand. They were ready to make the first call. Something struck that not now. The wrath of God has not yet come to the Gentiles. Their iniquity is not yet fulfilled. I thought, surely that's my imaginary mind. I started on out again. I thought I'd walk out towards the ramp. And I started walking out. And then there stood that light. As you see on the picture, that's the same pillar of fire that led the children of Israel. That's the same thing if this, if that light that you see there, which they've got here in America, they got it in Germany, they got it in Switzerland, where they're taking the pictures of it. That light will bear record of what it is. And if that light isn't of God, it won't bear record of God. But if it does the same works that Jesus did when he was here on earth, it said he come from that light that was in the Moses in the wilderness. Before Abraham was, I am. When he was here on earth, look what he done in flesh. He said, but I come from God and I go back to God. And when he returned after his resurrection, Paul met him on the road to Damascus and here he was, the pillar of fire again. Such a light so close to Paul it cut his eyes out. And he had to be led. He would come into the prison with Peter as a light. He's returned back that here he is again at the end of the Gentile age to do just exactly the way he did back there. Any vine bears fruit through the branch of what it is. But don't do the same thing Jesus did, then it's not Jesus. Certainly, if I told you the spirit of John Dillinger's in me, I'd have guns. And I'd be dangerous. If I told you the spirit of an artist is in me, you'd expect me to paint the picture of the artist. If I say the spirit of Christ in me, then it produces the works of Christ. He promised it. And then when I walked out to the ramp, he said, it's not yet. It's for a season yet. And I turned and went up to Mars Hill. From that back to the Vatican, then back home. Not just the time. When those Jews receive the gospel, you Gentiles are finished. God deals with Jews as a nation, us as a people. But Jews always as a nation, the nation of Israel, we're at the end time. This is a call to the Gentiles. God be merciful. He's here. You have to be with him or he can do nothing for you. What if Martha would have went out there and said to Jesus, Why didn't you come when I called you for my brother? The miracle would have never been done, but she approached him reverently. He said, Lord, if thou would have been here, my brother would not have died. But she said, even now, whatever you ask God, God will do it. Oh, how lovely. She said, thy brother shall rise again. She said, yes, Lord, he was a good boy. He'll raise in the general resurrection. He said, but I am the resurrection in life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. She said, Yea, Lord. I said, Believest thou this? He, she said, Yea, Lord, I believe that you were the Son of God that was to come into the world. There's a real believer in the presence of the real Holy Spirit that was in him. What's going to take place? I'm not speaking against anyone's religion, but a certain woman from a, a cult, that does not believe in the divine blood of Christ. They believe he was a prophet. Not only the Christian science, but a lot of you Protestants are getting the same thing poked down you. He was God. She said, Mr. Branham, I like to hear you speak, but you brag too much on Jesus. Of being divine, I said, he was divine. He was more than a prophet or a teacher. He was God, or the greatest deceiver the world ever had. She said, if I'll prove to you by your scriptures he wasn't nothing but a man, will you accept it? I said, if the scripture says so. She said, in St. John 11, when he went down to the grave of Lazarus, the Bible said he wept. I said, oh, lady, is that your scripture? She said, yes. I said, your scripture is... Thinner than the broth made out of a shadow of a chicken is starved to death. I said, you know better than that. I said, when he went down to the grave, he wept like a man. But 
when he pulled his little body up, which the Bible said there was no beauty we should desire him, but when he pulled that little frame together and said, Lazarus, come forth, and a man had been dead four days come to life, that was more than a man. When he come off the mountain in our text tonight, hungry, he was a man. But when he'd taken five biscuits and two pieces of fish and fed five thousand, that was more than a man. That was God speaking out of a man. He was more than a man when he told the woman at the well that she had five husbands. He was more than a man when he told Philip he saw him under the fig tree fifteen miles away when he was praying. He was a man when virtue had gone from him, the woman touching his garment, and so forth. And he laid on the back of a little ship, resting so tired. And ten thousand devils of the sea swore they had drowned him. And that little old boat out there like a bottle stopper, bouncing around, the devil said, we got him now. He was a man when he was laying down there on the boat asleep. But when he was aroused, and he walked up and put his foot on the rail of the boat, looked up and said, Peace, be still! And the winds and the waves obeyed him. He was more than a man. He was a man when he cried at Calvary for mercy. And he said, but on Easter morning, when he took the Roman field and rolled away the stone and stood on the earth again, he proved he was more than a man. Every man that's ever mounted to a hill of beans and this earth believed that, poets and so forth. One said, Brian Fanny Crosby said, Pass me not, O gentle Savior. Hear my humble cry, while on others I are calling, Do not pass me by. Thou the stream of all my comfort, more than life to me. Whom have I on earth beside thee, or whom in heaven but thee? When Eddie Pruitt wrote the inauguration song, when his Poet poetry was all turned down and refused. In that dark room, he grabbed the pen, and the Holy Ghost come on him, and he wrote the inauguration song. When he wrote, "All oh, hail the power of Jesus' name, let angels prostrate fall, bring forth the royal diadem, and crown him Lord of all." One said, "Living, he loved me; dying, he saved me; buried, he carried my sins far away." Rising, he justified freely forever. Someday he's coming. Oh, glorious day. He was more than a man. He was God. He's still God tonight. Father, we love to read your word. And we know that you are God and you can't die. You died once for our sins and rose again on the third day according to the Scriptures, and you live forevermore with ever promise to make good. Grant tonight, Lord, may not never be here again, but let this city know that you still live. Grant it, Lord. Now I submit myself to thee and commit everyone here to you and ask that you'll work through our flesh and through our spirit that everyone here might go home glorifying thee. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. See, I believe last night we called from the first part of the card. This picture here of the angel of the Lord, I don't know whether you've ever seen it or not, the writing is with it from the FBI, said, I once thought your meetings were psychology when you talked about the light. I wondered how this was done. Mr. George J. Lacey said, Mr. Branham, the mechanical eye of the camera won't take psychology. The light struck the lens. It's at the counter back there at the book stand. The boys will have it at the service. We have to buy it. It's on a copyright. We have to buy our books. They're on copyright. We have nothing to sell. We, or if I didn't think that would help someone, we'd never be here. Not my picture you're buying. It's his picture. Mr. Lacey said, there was a time when they doubted those lights and said it was a psychic thought of the artist that painted those halos and things around our Lord and around the apostles, but said this mechanical picture proves that it's the truth. Right. 
He said the old hypocrite, he meant the unbeliever. That's what he stated. I'm quoting his word just as he said it. He said they can't do it anymore. Then the scientific world knows that he still lives. The church knows he still lives because he remains the same. I'm thinking that last night we called from the first part of those prayer cards, didn't we? We called 15 or 20 of them. And tonight, what, what is it? F? Let's call the last part of them. We just, the boys come down, mix them all up together and give to you. See that you can see that we, we don't know who you are. When you mix them up, you might get one, the next one get 15, the next one get 22, and the next one get three. And then everyone's giving them out. They don't know where it's going to be called from. Just come right here. Call them here. Used to be, I would, I would have a little child to come up and count where he stopped. That's where we would start from. Believe it or not, Mama's brought little Sonny up to stop right where her number was, you see. So we're still dealing with human beings. So we just, and then look, up here on the, up on the platform, that don't mean one thing. You can be healed there just the same as you can here. How many knows that the scripture says this? When the woman touched his garment, she ran off out into the audience. Jesus said, who touched me? Who has touched me? And she, uh, Peter said, well, the whole group that touched me, he rebuked the Lord. But the Lord turned and said, somebody touched me because I've gotten weak. And he looked around until he found the little woman and he told her where her trouble was and she'd been healed. How many knows that scripture? Now, if he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, would he act the same today? Does the Bible say in Hebrews 13, 8 that he is the same yesterday and forever? Well, then, does the Bible say also in Hebrews that he's a high priest that can be touched by the feeling of our infirmities? What is he sitting at the right hand of God tonight, making intercession on our confession, a high priest? Then if he is the same yesterday, the same high priest, he'll have to act in the same way or he isn't the same. Now you just touch him by the feeling of your infirmities and see if he don't declare himself to be just exactly the same. I'll be real reverent, pray now. I don't say that he will. Let's see, let's start tonight from where? We can't call them all up here. Let's start from 85 to 100. That would give 15 on the platform at one time. All right. Who has prayer card F85? Raise up your hand. F85. Look at your card now. Somebody maybe can't get up. It's a handkerchief. In this basket here tonight. And you want one. How many believes in it? Let's see your hands. The Bible teaches it. You can just write to me. I'm not trying to get your address. I have nothing to sponsor. Not a thing. I have a hard time getting enough money to pay secretaries to help me answer it. You just write to me, Jeffersonville, India, and I'll send it to you free of charge. Let's pray. Lord, these handkerchiefs come here tonight for mothers and dads and for children and the little ones that are sick and needy, maybe an old blind father sitting in a room somewhere, poor mother laying on a bed of affliction, a little baby walking the floor. Thou knowest all about it. And we're taught in the Bible that they're taken off the body of St. Paul, handkerchiefs and aprons, they believe Paul when they see the works of God being done by him. We know we're not St. Paul, but we know that you're still Jesus. And we pray, Father, that you'll heal each one of these as we send them to the sick and the afflicted. In the sincerity of our hearts, we thank you for the people who've got confidence enough to believe yesterday. And may they be healed in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you. Ninety-two. Ninety-two and ninety-four is missing. Are they in the building? Eighty-nine, ninety-two. Right. Ninety-two is here. Number eighty-nine is missing. If it's in the building, if someone, I wish you'd look at your card. Maybe there's ninety. Ninety-three. 90 and 93. All right. If the number 90 is in the audience, or 93, would you come up anywhere between, uh, what was that called from? 85 to 100. Anywhere, anyone with prayer cards from 85 to 100, look at your neighbor. There may be someone deaf and dumb, and they're just sitting there. They don't, they don't know. You'll have to, maybe somebody can't even move. You pack them up. Just look around to the cards to someone who's got a card. Everybody's there now. Good. 
That's fine. How many doesn't have a prayer card and yet you want Jesus to heal you? Let's see your hand. Just have faith. Believe with all your heart. Now, thank you. Thank you. Now I want you to do something. Now you without a prayer card, you will not be on the platform as far as I know. Now, I want you to be in prayer just quietly and say, Lord Jesus, this brother tonight has talked to us and we've quoted scripture that you remain the same and you declared yourself before the Jews and Samaritans and in your day and said you did nothing until the Father showed you. The early church, or the Orthodox church, the old Jewish church in that day, said you was the algebra of the devil because you could perceive their thoughts. But the people of who these miracles were performed said that they believed you to be the Son of God and it was a sign of the Messiah. Now, we believe that Messiah is coming soon. And we believe that you're manifesting yourself to us today that we might be ready to escape. So, you're the same yesterday, today, and forever, we're told. So, Lord God, please tonight, let me touch your garment like the woman did. And then you turn by Brother Bram's lips and speak to me and tell me, just like you did the, the, the woman, then, Lord, I'll give you all the praise and glory. I'll bring you. I just see if he remains the same. What a challenge. Do you, friends, I'm sure you don't get that. Do you realize what that means? And look here, there's not a person in this building that I know. Not a person but Mr. Sweet. Mr. Bale. Mr. Gold sitting right here, and my boy was here a while ago, he's gone. All right, that's the only persons I know in this building. But God knows you all. Now, is this the lady? Here is a picture of St. John Four, man and woman. I suppose this is our first time ever meeting. It is. Can you hear the lady or see if she nods her head? Would you just raise your hand so they see? I do not know her, I've never seen her in my life. She's woman, I'm man. Here we are standing here for the first time of meeting. Now, if there's something wrong with her, I do not know. She might be a critic. She might be here just bluffing. If she is, watch what happens. How many has ever been in meetings and seen what happened like that? My, my. Some them drop over, paralyzed, go insane, everything. Well, it seems the same God, the book of Acts 19, just the same. The Lord will decide that. Let him say it. She may be a sinner. She may be a hypocrite. She might be a Christian. I don't know. But here, something's got to happen. Let her be the judge. If I said, lady, you're sick, I'm going to lay my hands on you, you're going to get well. She could doubt that she just got my word. But what if the Holy Spirit comes and tells her something that, that she, she knows that I don't know? Then she'd be the judge of that. Then if he knows what was, he'll know what will be. Now this is for you people in the balconies. You're not too far away. Never out of reach of Christ. You just believe where you're safe. How many up there are sick and want Christ to heal you? Raise your hands anywhere around. Just believe. Just have faith. Now, here we are. Just like St. John, the fourth chapter, man and a woman meeting, begin to speak, and Jesus found what was the woman's trouble. He told her where her trouble was and what her trouble was. And she said, you must be a prophet. Now, we know the Messiah will do that. He said, I'm him. And she ran into the city and said, come see a man who told me the things that I've done. Isn't this the Messiah? I said this last night. I said it again tonight. That woman knowed more about God than 80% of our American preachers. Right, go a prostitute. She recognized that. She knew more about God and them priests and rabbis and things did. They said, he's the Elzebub, a devil. She said, he's Messiah. <laughs> now, who was right? All right, lady. Then that I've been speaking tonight a little, just to carry a conversation with you till I get the knowing that the Holy Spirit is anointing. Now, if he will let me know what you're here for, and you know I don't know, then you will, you'll accept that. All right, sir. How many out there will say, I'll do the same? 
Is there anyone out there that knows this woman? Yes, there's quite a few. Well, you know her here in your city then. You know all about it. Now, so we just, you be the judge. My sister, just to speak to you as a man, and the only thing I, this is to be for, God don't have to do this, but he promised he'd do it. He didn't have to kneel when he was here on earth, but he promised he'd do it. The prophet said he took our infirmities and bore our sickness. He had to fulfill that. And the Bible said he's the same yesterday and forever, and that's where he declared himself to the ending of that generation. He's got to do the same today to fulfill the scripture. So here we are at the end of the Gentile age. The woman is a Christian, and she is a believer. That's right. She's not so much standing here for herself, although she has a gland trouble that makes her overweight. But there's something else on her heart that she desires, and she's been praying much about this that she's desiring, and that is about her husband. That's right. Is it, that's the truth. Now, do you believe? Now, you be the judge. Now, I don't know now what I said. See, it's on the tape there if you ever want it. They have it on the tape. See, what happens, it's a vision. You're somewhere else, maybe years back, or maybe ahead, or whatever it is. You're somewhere in another world. You just yield yourself. It's a gift. Yield yourself to the Holy Spirit. What does that prove? That the same Holy Spirit that was in the early church and in Christ and sure in this church, moving through his body as he promised. That ought to make belief, faith just rise to a place where everything would happen. But why is it we're so dead in spirit? Now, if you think it was just Jesse, let's take our time on the woman and talk to her a little. All right, lady, whatever he said was the truth. Now, I don't know what it was. There, the, And you realize that standing before a man, me, would make you feel the way you're feeling now. You're a very nice person. And you're in perfect contact with something, a real sweet, humble feeling. That's the Holy Spirit. See that light? That light is what's making you feel that way. I'm looking right at it. It's right around Now, if Christ was here wearing these clothes that he gave me, if you need healing, he couldn't heal you. He's already did it when he died at Calvary. He'd do something to prove that he was the Christ. Then you believe in his vicarious suffering, his death, burial, and resurrection, know that he still lives. If he still lives after all those years and remains the same, and every way I healing, and salvation was purchased, it's already been done. You just have to believe it. So he just, the only thing he could do would be manifest himself that he should to declare that what he did there is standing good tonight. Yes, the woman begins to come into the vision again. Yes, it's a grand trouble. She's overweighted. Anyone can see that. And it's a grand condition. Yes, I see a man appearing again. It's her husband. And he's got something wrong it's uh, in his legs. It's flea bitus, both of his legs. And here, that man is walking out of the will of God. He had a call to the ministry. And he's putting something else before that. He's doing other work and not fulfilling that call. And the reason he's doing that is because you are a woman preacher yourself. And he, and he thinks that one preacher in the family might be enough, but he's wrong. You're not from this city. No, you're not. You're from, a city, you're from New York, a city called Schenectady. And your name is Mrs. Reed. That thus saith the Lord. Now go back and find it the way you believe it. Have you believed it? It shall be just as you have asked. God bless you. You believe the Lord with all your heart? Now you in the audience. Have faith. Now, don't doubt. Don't move around. Sit real still, please. See? Spirit, when they leave people like evil spirits, they go from one to another. You know that. When you get an audience jumping and running, you can't hold it. 
you don't, you know, you're trying to take the time to explain it. You just believe it. That's all. You just believe it. The lady here is a stranger to me, as far as I know. I don't know her. Looks like a healthy woman. But I don't know. God does know. But if he will reveal to me, what's your trouble? You believe me? You'd get over them ulcers. You was praying for that, wasn't you, sir? I don't know you, do I? Never seen you in my life. That's right, raise up your hand. You're a nervous person. Real nervous, which has caused you to have ulcers. Go on, preach the word now. You're a preacher anyhow, so you go preach the word. You got your arms around your friend, man. What do you think about this, sir? Do you believe me to be his prophet or his servant? You do? If he will reveal to me what you want, will you accept it? Of course, you're wearing glasses. A man your age should wear glasses. But that's not it. Your eyes are going bad. You want prayer for your eyes. That's what you want. And you got arthritis, too. You want prayer for that. That's right, isn't it? Are you accept your healing now? Raise up your hand if you do. It's over. You go home. Be well. Your faith has healed you. What did they touch? Well, I ask you now, reverently, what did they touch? Before God, I have never seen neither man. No, nothing of them. But someone was praying. It was the big man that was doing the praying. And because he was sitting with his body around the other man as a contact, that's what done it for the next man. I ask them, God be the judge. Now, does Jesus Christ remain the high priest that can be touched with the feeling of our infirmity? Is he alive tonight? I, it's faith in the audience, sister. I just, wherever that light goes, I, I just go with it. See, that's all I can do. Now, maybe he come to you. If the Lord will reveal to me what you want from him, you believe? You know if it's healing, I couldn't heal you. But if there's something, you got a thing on your arm, or it's a, you, you got low blood pressure, that's what it is. <laughs> low blood pressure. Not only that, but I see a hospital. It's for someone else you're standing there for. And that's a friend of yours that's uh, in the hospital from an accident. That's bones in their body broke. You're a teacher yourself, a Sunday school teacher. Now go receive it just as you believe it. It'll be that way. God bless you. I'll be with you. You love it now. Please, please, please. I do not know you. God does know you. Do you believe me to be his servant? If he will tell me what you're here for, you believe it then? I please, just sit still just a moment. My son will come get me in a few minutes, so be real reverend. Don't move around. Be real reverend. See, God is in his holy temple. Let's be reverent. You suffer from a nervous condition. And you got trouble in your spine. That is true. How would I know that? It has to come from something that's present here who knows you. Do you believe it? The Lord Jesus let me do this? Now, just a moment, if the audience can still hear me. There's a man coming up there. A vision's moving now. 
with her son, and he's bothered with a nervous trouble, and you won't pray for him. That's right. He isn't here. He lives in New York. And I'll tell you, if you believe me to be a servant, that boy's a Catholic, by faith. That's right. Do you believe now that God will make it well to give to him? You accept it? Or right. go over there, take that handkerchief sent to him, it'll be over. God bless you. Have faith in God, don't doubt. There's an evil power that keeps sweeping from that audience somewhere. God can heal epilepsy. You believe it? You believe he'll make you well? Raise up your hand there, sir, if you believe with all your heart, right here. Now have faith in God and it'll all be over. <laughs> That's the devil that usually gets away from us. He does evil. I, a disobedient audience, I've seen 28 take it at one time after it's cast out of a baby. He still got it, too. Remember when they come out of a legion, they went into hogs. They got to go somewhere. The Holy Spirit still hangs there. It's the man sitting next to him there. Something happened to the man. You believe you cure heart trouble too? You had heart trouble with praying for the heart trouble to be healed. That's right. The lady's sitting there. There he goes. Has that light right straight for the lady. He's uh, the woman's got cataracts on her eye. That's right, isn't it, lady? Believe him. He'll leave you. Praise the Lord. Oh, he is real. If thou canst believe, you believe, I do not know you, but I see you are here for someone else, and you were sitting in this audience last night, and the Holy Spirit called you, and you were healed with a throat trouble last night, thus saith the Lord. And you're standing here for someone else, your brother, and he's not here. He's got cancer, and he's he's in a place called Toronto, Canada, Ontario, up in Canada. That's right. That little handkerchief or parcel that you wipe that tear from, send it to him. Don't doubt. You'll get well. Amen. Have faith in God. Oh, does his presence make you recognize? Jehovah still lives. Jesus, the same yesterday, today, and forever. I do not know you, lady. You're a stranger to me. There's something on her heart. She is praying for someone else, which is an elderly woman. That's her mother. And her mother has paralysis. She's a crippled woman. You are a minister's wife. And you've got others on your heart that you're praying for. Don't doubt. Have faith. You'll receive what you ask for. You believe it? God help you then. Go and receive it, my sister. All right. The Lord God knows both of us, ladies. I do not know you. But God does know us. If he will tell me what you're here for, you believe? Will the audience believe? I see a boy, someone's praying about drinking. The lady right there, that elderly lady, 
you're praying for a son of yours that drinks and gets drunk. Stand up to your foot just a minute, lady. You believe that God would sober that boy and send him home to you, make a Christian out of him? Lord God of heaven, I pray for that dear mother and for that boy. May he come to himself like the prodigal son and return in Jesus' name. Amen. Don't doubt. If thou canst believe. Had your head down praying, high blood pressure was nothing for God to heal. You believe you'd do it, sir? Believe it, God? You had your head down praying then. That's right, wave up your hand like this. All right? I don't know you do, I sir. God's healed you now. Just go believing with all your heart. God will grant it to you. pale-looking lady. That's one you're talking to, sir. Asking for mercy. You believe God could heal that gall, bladder, trouble, make you well? You believe it? Stand up to your feet. You know you feel different. It's gone from you now. You go on your road and rejoice. You are here for a real good purpose. You're asking God something that's going to be out of the ordinary, but I've seen the Lord do it. Even at your age, you'd still like to have a baby. You've been a mother, but not by of your own, mother of others, children, stepchildren, but you want one of your own. That's what Hannah come to the temple for. That's what was on your mind. That's what you prayed about before you left your home. I see your husband, he's an Italian, isn't he? He's in trouble. He needs healing on his leg, on his knee, in his arm. That is right. All right, go believe it now, and you can have what you asked for. Do you believe with all your heart? Wouldn't you like to eat again and feel good? That stomach trouble is so bad. The nervous condition it calls it. Now, it, 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 there's so much of it out there, I can't even see which is which. You are believing now. Amen. A faith is striking the audience. Let me show you what I mean. Let me, let, watch here. How many of you out there that's suffering with a nervous condition? Raise your hands. I just want to show you. For nearly 80% of the audience. Every one of you that suffers with a nervous condition, stand to your feet right now just a minute. You stand right here. I'll show you the glory of God anywhere. Every person bothered with a nervous condition, stand to your feet. Come. Just remain standing. If God will reveal to me, young woman, what's your trouble, will you believe with all your heart? If you do, you'll never have to have that operation. God can dissolve that tumor just as well as it can be. Do you believe it? Accept it? Anyone suffering with tumor or growth, stand to your feet just now. Come believe it. Hers is nervousness too. If God can do it here, God can do it there. How many is sick or needing healing out there that will raise to your feet just a minute? Stand up just a moment. It is so lifelike over the audience. 
Do you believe me to be his servant? Then take my word. The Holy Spirit is just got the building completely covered. It just looks like a milky haze everywhere. This is the hour of your healing. There will not be a feeble one among us in a few minutes. If you're only believing, do you believe it? I stand right here for your healing. No matter what your trouble, get ready right now. Christ has healed every one of you. Are you ready to accept it? Then if he's already done it, there's one thing left. Raise our hands and praise him for it. Let us raise our hands. Lord God, creator of heavens and earth, author of everlasting life and giver of every good gift, we now pronounce curses upon the devil. He's defeated and we ask healing for this audience. Just now, in Jesus Christ's name, let it be done. With your head bowed yet, are you aware that Jesus Christ, God's Son, is here? If you are and you've been doubting your experience, you have not the Holy Spirit, or you're a sinner, will you come up here right now, right in the presence of him, right here now, right around the altar. Move right out and come here, just a minute. Move right out of your seat, come right down the aisle and come here, just a minute. Stand right around the altar here a minute for prayer. That's right, soldier. Come right on, now the rest of you. Come right along. Move right out now. Right out of your seats, right down the aisle here. Everyone. Give us a little card on the... Yeah.